Chapter 1. Wind Up Sir, Recruit Sizer requests permission to speak, sir! I sprayed a little spit when I yelled this, and some of his spit landed on me when the drill instructor barked his reply. Speak! Sir, Recruit Sizer requests permission to venture beyond the tree line in order to secure a field expedient means by which to square away his hooch, sir! Marines talk funny, and in boot camp they talk funnier, but even this was too much for the D.I. God damn it, Sizer. Use English. Sir, I need to... He thundered. Are we on a date now? Why are you whispering at me, boy? One of the less enjoyable aspects of life on Paris Island is all the constant yelling. From the moment you step off the bus until the day you graduate, it never stops. Anyone who's ever seen a movie about Marine Corps boot camp already knows that the drill instructors do a lot of yelling. One significant aspect the filmmakers fail to show is that the recruits do a lot of yelling, too. It's required. Unless you request permission to speak in a normal conversational tone, sir, every word that comes out of your nasty little pie hole must be shouted at top volume, or there will be hell to pay. Part of the reason for this is that it ruins your vocal cords and eventually strengthens them when they recover, giving you the ability to project that loud, intimidating, gravelly command presence associated with the jarheads. The ability to articulate while shouting also comes in handy outdoors, especially when you need to give orders as things are exploding around you. Also, when you scream everything you say, there's little room for ums and ahs. A few weeks of this yields an unexpected side effect of making you confident to the extreme. I was still far from this stage, and was momentarily distracted by the mental image of being on a date with my D.I. Spit it out, son! Sir, I'd like to find something I can use to fix my tent. Go. He must have been tired, or my request would have been denied, and I would have been thrashed for using the personal pronouns. On top of all of the yelling, we always had to refer to ourselves in the third person. Looking back, I can now see the logic behind that rule. If you're trying to create a platoon of unblinking killers who instantly follow every order without question, you can't have their heads cluttered up with distracting concepts like I or my. Aye, aye, sir! I executed my best about-face and ran to my task. We weren't allowed to walk. I was 21, and had only slept in a tent two other times, both here at Paris Island. But during my teenage years, I slept outside almost every night. We lived in a few places, mostly small apartments near Pittsburgh, so outside meant the porch. I could see Orion rise from the spot where I put my sleeping bag, and I loved the wind on my face at night. Still do. Before I turned in each night, I would wander the neighborhood, sometimes alone, but often in the company of friends. A small group of similarly bored teenagers would gather at someone's house, and we'd roam for hours. The internet hadn't been invented yet, and our little suburb was quiet and devoid of the one thing every teen craves most, something to do. So we walked. A lot. We didn't always have a car growing up, so I also put in many miles schlepping back and forth to school, grandma's house, to go get groceries, which I helped pay for using money from my paper route, which, of course, I walked. I should have seen it coming. The first time the Marines put a pack on me and forced me to march was the first time I really relaxed. While everyone else was limping along with blisters or hunched under the weight of their loads, I was lost in my thoughts. My pack and rifle were lighter than the bass drum I carried in marching band, so my back didn't hurt. My feet were already conditioned from years of being too poor to drive, and it was easy to drift off into a trance when the only thing you had to remember to do was occasionally say, I don't know, but I've been told Eskimo women are mighty cold. Another distinct advantage I enjoyed in boot camp was my height. Our marching formations were arranged from tallest to shortest, and as one of the lankiest recruits in the platoon, I got to take a spot up front. When we were on the move, I could stare at the horizon instead of the backs of identical shaved heads. We were also paired by height for activities, which meant that my lunch buddy, tent mate, and hand-to-hand -hand combat partner were all the same guy, Recruit Nichols. Nichols was also six foot three, but he had played football, had won his local tough guy competition, and carried about fifty more pounds of muscle than I did. 
The first time we shared a tent, I squeezed into my side and did my best to lie still while he snored and sweat beside me. Eventually, he'd settle, and the wind and the crickets would be my lullaby. I didn't realize it, but I was happy. The tents we carried were of an interesting design. Each recruit is issued half of a tent, officially called a shelter half. You get one tent pole, a few metal stakes, and enough heavy canvas to form 50% of a pup tent. Each shelter half has snaps that join it with any other half, so that, theoretically, any two random recruits can pair up and spend the night. We had dumped our packs, and as the D.I.s swarmed around us, screaming orders and punishing the slowpokes, Nichols had stepped on my tent pole, snapping it in two. That's why I found myself rummaging through the brush, trying to find a straight piece of pine just the right length. Hurry up! We are waiting on you, Sizer, any day now! I grabbed something too long and sprinted back, figuring I could just snap off the excess length. Nichols was standing at attention before the failed pile of canvas that was our home. The other recruits were at attention, too, and had been that way the whole time. Tensed up, heels together, feet at a 45-degree angle, fingers curled, thumb at the trouser seams, head and eyes to the front, mouths shut. None of them had seen me running around, but they had all just heard my name enough times to know that any ensuing trouble would be my fault, even if it wasn't. The D.I. ordered Nichols and me to unfuck yourselves, and while we fixed our shelter, he explained what was up next. We were going to compete against another platoon in something called Pugil Sticks. Pugil is short for pugilist, which meant we were in for some good old-fashioned face-smashing. If you've ever seen American Gladiators or a similar TV show, you're familiar with the event in which two opponents square off on a balance beam, each armed with a giant padded Q-tip which they use to bash each other while wearing football helmets. Our senior drill instructor stepped forward to motivate us. While two of his equally intimidating assistants flanked him, he explained that our victory was certain. Our success was guaranteed because our senior D.I. had a trick up his sleeve, an incentive which would whip us into a frenzy. Each timid recruit would be transformed into a raging berserker because if we won, we would get an amazing reward. He told us that if we emerged victorious, he would not skin us alive and make flower pots from our skulls. This seemed fair. He then offered an additional incentive, a bonus so ridiculous I took it as exaggeration. He really seemed serious about that flower pot thing. Anyone who could hit someone from the opposing team hard enough to send them to sickbay would get a phone call home. We lined up and marched another mile or so to the makeshift combat arena. Again, most everything is ordered by height, so I was up first. I was pitted against someone as tall, but built more like my tentmate. He was a wall of camouflage, with a helmet and a stick, and he didn't look to be anywhere near as nervous as I was. As the referee lifted the whistle to his mouth, I imagined my opponent's stick flying up to my face. I could see myself toppling off the beam and into a world of pain and push-ups. I was going to lose, and I knew it. The ref drew his breath, and in that moment, I had an idea. It was a long shot, but I knew I was outmatched physically. My opponent knew it, too, and locked eyes with me. Just as the ref blew the whistle, I blew my opponent a kiss. He blinked and cocked his head. I heard him mumble, huh? And watched him hesitate just long enough for me to reach up and score a point by touching his chin with my stick. Both platoons threw up their arms and booed. The senior D.I. was livid. Damn it, Sizer! Take off that gear and give it to a real man! Nichols, kill someone. I took a seat, as well as a few more insults, and gave my helmet and stick to recruit Nichols. His opponent was another tall guy, but skinny, like me. Why couldn't I get that one, I wondered. Before the ref had time to blow the whistle, Nichols charged across the beam, bellowing his war cry. The slender recruit didn't even have a chance to lift his stick before Nichols wound up and brained him like a silverback gorilla hitting a t-ball. The kid was out cold instantly, flat on his back, both eyes closed. The blow knocked his helmet off, and after it rolled to a stop, someone verified that he was still breathing. The kid was still unconscious when the medics hauled him off, and the next day we learned that one of his vertebrae in his neck had been cracked. He'd recover, but his military career was over before it began. The senior D.I. congratulated Nichols and gave him a free pass to the payphones. 
He then ordered the rest of us to give Nichols our home phone numbers so that a real man could chat up our moms while the rest of us miserable shit stains stayed back to scrub the squad bay and think about how we'd failed our country. <laughs>